So what we will do in the next uh, 45 minutes as part of this session is to actually look at uh, uh, some of the threats that we see happening uh, across uh, regions that we operate in. So we actually cover uh, uh, Asia, we cover uh, Middle East, uh, we work in Europe, we also cover uh, US and uh, in small steps we also work with a few organizations in Jamaica, we have started our work. So uh, what we are going to really cover is to look at uh, the kind of newer kind of attacks that we see across all of these geographies, what's happening globally and also to look at uh, what kind of controls are uh, organizations looking at, how are they coping up with uh, these kind of uh, threats happening. So the focus uh, here is of course on the uh, what as an enterprise can you do. Uh, while at the government level we have definitely seen CERT operations uh, going up in terms of scale and uh, becoming the central point for countries to actually look at threats affecting them and uh, what steps to be taken, uh, etc. So uh, for example, recently we had uh, uh, anonymous group which is like an underground uh, network of uh, uh, hackers uh, attacking India because India had blocked certain sites and they felt that that's coming in the way of freedom, etc. So there were a series of attacks on a lot of government sites, uh, you know, banks and uh, telecom infrastructure, etc. So uh, at that point in time, uh, we also realized that uh, a role of CERT is also critical apart from the fact that organizations need to scale up on their own. So the focus of this presentation is going to be on how do you scale up as an organization to actually look at the new threats and how do you manage to uh, fend them off. So. To start with, uh, typical way of managing security in any uh, organization today across the world, you would have some functional blocks. For example, you know, you could look at organizations typically will have uh, policies, procedures, you know, some kind of baselines that are uh, developed and told that this is the baseline on which the organization will operate. And to some, to good extent, most organizations will have, you know, some kind of uh, 24 into 7 or monitoring of their networks. So uh, just to understand uh, how many organizations here have some form of uh, monitoring that is happening in terms of monitoring of logs, threats, I think yeah, pretty much many, many organizations uh, do have it. And I am sure that most of you also do some kind of uh, testing of your network, of your applications on some kind of periodicity and of course there will be a level of uh, reporting uh, that you do. and. Uh, some level of compliance to regulations and also manage your uh, uh, IT processes in a secure way. So while this forms the foundation uh, layer uh, for managing security across the globe for many enterprises, the question really is given the new kind of threats that have come in, is this enough or what is it that we need to do more to make sure that we are uh, secure. So what we will do is we will take up uh, each new threat change that has happened, the, the key trends. We look at basically four trends which consolidates most of the things that have happened and then see whether you know that is good enough or what do we need to do more to be able to uh, secure ourselves against these newer kind of uh, threats happening. So the first one that we are going to take up is if you really look at uh, the last one and a half to two years many of the big uh, impact attacks that have happened globally have been because the threats or attacks have become stealth. It is stealth because very difficult to detect that it is happening. It is deep. It can start anywhere in the network and spread and go on to reach the uh, key asset that is being targeted and it is persistent because it remains in the network for uh, 6 to 8 months to 1 year to 2 years before the actual impact uh, surfaces. So last year if you see we had some poster boy breaches happening. So I'm sure all of you have seen the, have read about the RSA breach that happened, uh, the Google breach, the Nasdaq breach. Interestingly enough the uh, RSA, so many of these have different motives and uh, RSA breach for example uh, was a slow attack that happened over a period of uh, uh, 8 eight months to uh, 12 months which finally led to exposure of the uh, seeds that were controlling the tokens which basically meant that the tokens could be compromised using the seeds. So this, the attackers managed to steal the seed for all these tokens. 
why did they do it uh, is it because they wanted to compromise rsa it is not so because rsa was just an intermediary essentially because the target was lockheed martin because lockheed martin was using a lot of these tokens to protect their uh, network and why lockheed martin because lockheed martin happens to be the defense contractor for us so if you compromise lockheed martin you get access to a lot of defense documents of us government so it was a chain of uh, incidents that finally led to cracking of rsa uh, tokens similarly if you see google google was also hacked uh, about last year attempts were there essentially because uh, uh, chinese government wanted to possibly capture some of the uh, human right activist mails and information that was uh, flowing through and nasdaq was again compromised with a malware which was there in uh, in an application called directors desk it was capturing all kinds of uh, information that uh, company directors were posting into that application essentially because that could be then used for insider trading so the uh, the the motives vary from uh, financial motives to political motives you know uh, and also to motives uh, like uh, uh, in terms of standing up for a certain cause like how anonymous does so it is not really financial or political but it's more of an activist kind of uh, role so motives vary and the end result is you have complex attacks which typically works the the typical modus operandi could be something like this uh you might have a couple of employees in the organizations being targeted so the employee gets a mail uh, maybe the finance department gets a mail that says that uh, uh if you open this attachment you would possibly you know be able to benchmark how some other companies are doing so you open the attachment the attachment is totally blank it just has one macro that runs on your desktop hacks the desktop puts a malware on it and then with that malware the attack continues for about 6 months 8 months hopping from one system to another and then finally the real system gets uh, compromised so the real question is uh, if i were to ask audience here with show of hands uh, how many of you feel that this kind of a slow stealth and persistent attack can actually be detected by a very conventional security mechanisms that uh, we have i think most of us feel that it cannot be detected which is true because if you just go with uh, looking at ids logs or uh, simple firewall logs and then look at uh, monitoring them you would definitely miss these kind of attacks so the idea is the complexity of attacks have uh, phenomenally increased over the last few years so the question is how do you make sure that uh, we are able to uh, detect this so that is really where as an industry uh, information security today has moved to the level of looking at uh, adding one more layer so you would be pretty familiar with most of you who are into the trenches in terms of managing security on an ongoing basis would know all these layers uh, you do vulnerability management uh, testing of networks patch management you monitor your networks using uh, saem tool or uh, ids ips logs uh, database monitoring you manage all your devices and most of these today gets linked through a services layer that a service provider provides or as a team you do it and then you have a portal that reports but what is missing is this yellow piece that you see here which today has been brought in by most vendors called uh, security intelligence because this is the layer that will now go on to enable you to be able to detect these kind of complex attacks so uh, to take an example of uh, how uh security intelligence is incorporated into the uh, saem or uh, security uh, information and event management systems is uh, what the saem uh, systems uh, bring in today is a lot of analytics coming into picture so typically if you see uh, saem systems are all been rule based which means you know you basically write a lot of rules to detect uh, specific kind of attacks but that is not good enough to detect these kind of complex attacks so what is happening today is you look at a kind of applying security analytics uh, into these different logs and sources that you have and then see what is anomalous behavior so to take a simple example in terms of looking at the uh, context so if you really look at the uh, finance department accessing your engineering servers or a hr department accessing your engineering servers i mean that is like a like anomalous access but today without security intelligence and context being in place you cannot detect these kind of attacks because 
the context or historical profile. So if you actually kind of take six months of data and baseline all the access in your network, you would find that there is a certain pattern. So X number of people log in at a certain time, they happen to access X number of systems, mail, websites, all of that. But if you have a kind of historical profile maintained for that, when a new kind of attack happens, you can easily detect that this is a deviation from what is normal. So that is a kind of intelligence that has been built now into these uh, newer SIEM products that are coming in. But that's just not enough for managing security. So you need some more blocks in terms of how do you handle these bigger threats. So to take some examples, uh, there is a concept called cross intelligence today. So what is cross intelligence? You take any asset and for any asset you will have certain attacks that have happened. You have certain weaknesses or vulnerabilities on that particular as uh, at asset. So how do you actually go about mining more uh, intelligence from this information that you have to make a better decision on what kind of response you need to take. So just to take an example, let's assume that there is a threat here uh, on the application. So if you need more intelligence on that, if you actually, what you need to really know is uh, in order to act on the threat, how many times has this threat occurred? So maybe if it has just happened three times. It may not be that big an occurrence, but if it has happened 20 times, you have to think about it to act quickly. The other aspect is any attack that happens is trying to exploit a certain weakness. So if you know that the asset is already vulnerable to that particular weakness, if the asset has the weakness in it, that means you prioritize for a higher action. Because if you are having an attack and if the asset is vulnerable, you are obviously looking at a compromise. So you need to take faster action on that. So that's the kind of quick intelligence that you need to be able to respond faster to the newer kind of attacks happening. Uh, similarly, if you have, uh, you do, I'm sure that most of you here do a lot of uh, testing across assets at the application level, at the server level, and you have a lot of results lying around. So typically, where do these results, uh, where are these results consolidated? I mean, today it would be all in different uh, documents that you get from vendors that is kept by different teams across different directories. So at any point in time, if you need to quickly know that these are the vulnerabilities that I have and which are the assets that are affected by it, because I need to have that to understand my security posture, you don't really have a mechanism. So what you need is to have a kind of a database of all the vulnerabilities that you have, the ratings, and then also look at how many assets are affected by it. So if you have a large number of assets affected by a certain vulnerability, obviously you need to take a faster action on that. So to see more intelligence on this, you can actually take a certain vulnerability and then do the same thing as what we did last time. Uh, for this particular vulnerability, how many times is this, has it occurred in the network and are there attacks corresponding to it that is happening. So if you have attacks happening, obviously you need to take faster action on that. Similar extension of the concept is to actually see if uh, for a particular asset, how many vulnerabilities for, for a particular vulnerability, how many assets are affected and you want more information on the asset. Uh, all of us realize that uh, as an information security professional, we have limited time and there are way too many vulnerabilities. So how do you prioritize, where do I spend more time? So if you know the asset details, what is the value of the asset, what is the business value of the asset, uh, what kind of threats have happened, what is my mean time to detect this kind of an attack, how much time do I take to fix this? With all the data on asset that is available, I can take a call in terms of how quickly do I need to act on this vulnerability. So that's the kind of cross intelligence that we are uh, talking about. And you can also you can also see the asset uh, value and what are the sub assets uh, running on a particular asset, etc. The other concept that is uh, missing today is once you do a network test, for example, you have a report that says on the network these are the weaknesses. But for the same asset, you are not really sure what are the other weaknesses lying around on that same asset. So uh, the concept of vulnerability magnifier means that for an asset, if you know that these are the application vulnerabilities which are there, I can also quickly see what network vulnerabilities are there. So I know the consolidator risk of the asset that you know if I am uh, susceptible to something like a SQL injection, I can also have a network level vulnerability that leads to a, a complete compromise of the system. So, Magnification of vulnerability again becomes an important factor and the uh, final concept here is vulnerability propagation which basically means 
uh, if you look at uh, most of the assets uh, today you would know how these assets talk to each other so internet banking would have would be talking to a database server through a middleware you will have uh, it talking to a channel integrator to talk to an ATM switch etc but because the attacks are propagating from any asset and then moving on to the final asset you need to have a view of how vulnerabilities can propagate in your network so if you know that there are weaknesses in internet banking and channel integrator you know for sure that this is a path that can finally lead to an ATM switch as well getting compromised so the idea is do I have a better map of my network and vulnerabilities lying around so that I know what is the path of propagation apart from this you also need to have quick query builders so that's the other kind of intelligence so you can quickly search for the kind of threats that are there and repeat threats how many times uh, have I seen server configuration changes which are not authorized happening in my network how many times is it repeating same way you can also have the ability to query for many different types of parameters so you could see what are my high risk vulnerabilities what is the time to detect time to remediate so you could basic idea is how do I consolidate the data that I have today to be able to run quick queries to take intelligent decisions on the next steps that I need to take so that's the whole idea of query builder and finally uh, in terms of uh, the final step in security intelligence is uh, we talked about SIEMs having a lot of intelligence that have got built in the limitation still is that an SIEM is still supposed to be a real time system so it cannot have a lot of deep dive analytics because it takes a lot of resources and you need to really uh, it takes a lot of time as well so the idea is while you have a set of base analytics on your platforms and security intelligence is available to manage these issues you also need to have a level of offline deep dive analytics so the idea is you would possibly take all these logs and run it in an offline mode where there is more need for more computation power but the whole idea is the baselining that we talked about in terms of anomalous behavior uh, can be easily captured through these techniques so the simple example is uh, you know if you actually look at all the uh, the SAEM logs or IDS firewall logs and run it through a deep dive analytical system you can take a number of parameters and if you actually map it through clustering you might know that month one when you baseline you have two types of attacks and you set a baseline saying okay these are the type of attacks these are my controls this is how I'll go about managing them and month two when you run you might suddenly see that there is a deviation that there is a new form of cluster that has come in so this could typically be a cluster that relates to a deep attack that is happening or a stealth attack that is happening so that enables you to better respond and detect the slow attacks as compared to conventional uh, mechanisms so same way uh, the next slide is a bit uh, possibly scary to look at but <laughs> the, the, this is essentially the output of a deep dive analytical algorithm that uh, we ran uh, using uh, typical active directory logs so what you see here is whatever you see inside the cloud is your typical footprint so you might have 1000 users, 4000 users logging into Active Directory, some people will forget their passwords, you will have failed logins, uh, some people will uh, log out at a certain time. So this becomes a footprint of what is normal and if you see very at a distant point there are you know certain other clusters which are not part of this community, basically you need to explore this more because this could be the deviation or the stealth attack that is happening. So that's, that's the... Uh, so, so this is essentially all about one concept of how globally organizations are managing security better by bringing in more security intelligence. So we are up against a set of uh, well organized, uh, uh, well funded threat actors. So we are not really looking at amateurs here. Just like Michelle was saying, today it's a group of organized crime syndicates that we are up against. So if you go to one of these sites, you could actually get to see uh, and buy uh, credit card information so this is like the uh, as of last update in terms of the rates at which uh, uh, people can buy cards so obviously the uh, the rate of buy increases with more information that you have so if you have a credit card with a lot of details it can sell to as much as you know 190 dollars per card but if you just have like uh, basic information it could be anywhere between two dollars to ninety dollars and if you have a lot of online account details it could go up to thousand five hundred dollars 
the other part is the technology to buy this uh, you can also just straight away buy off a fake ATM with an inbuilt skimmer so you could actually buy it at about $35,000 and then you know put up an ATM in a mall and make it look like a bank's ATM and nobody would even know that you know they were trying to do transactions in a fake ATM so so that's the kind of uh, the uh, infrastructure that we are up against so obviously and so Carda Planet uh, which the uh, ad that we saw was for this website of course the name and uh, the form of the site keeps changing because uh, uh, right now you have FBI and uh, UK uh, government etc running after these sites taking them down so they come in new forms new kind of uh, information but they are all there so the uh, idea is because it is uh, well funded uh, threat actors obviously the uh, target uh, of attack is no longer about uh, defacing a website or trying to say that you know trying to prove that they have done something uh, better so the whole idea is to show that uh, because there is more financial motivation and money to be made out of all this the target today is shifting from just looking at it as an attack on a website to looking at it as attacks on uh, databases from where information can be taken uh, business applications that can be used to transact data to get more uh, uh, financial gains so the target is more on the business side today as compared to just looking at it as infrastructure so uh, as an organization like what Sachin was saying we have security operation center uh, out of Bangalore we also have security operation centers in uh, three other geographies in Southeast Asia so we uh, monitor around 20,000 assets uh, using a set of these just our SOC apart from of course managing a number of security operation centers for our customers so when we ran all the data that we had in terms of the uh, threats external threats happening and we saw the results uh, it was very obvious that you know about more than 50 percent of the uh, attacks that we see actually happen on uh, the business side of things so it could be on business applications uh, it could be on ATM uh, internet banking it is on uh, SQL injection kind of attacks phishing attacks uh, business application platform exploits uh, financial trojans to capture banks username passwords or maybe a telecom sites username password so all of this forms the top attacks that are happening so obviously the attack is more on the business side of things and corroborated by the fact that uh, it is these kind of attacks that we saw last year as well uh, Citibank got breached the online banking platform for breached 200,000 accounts exposed in US you had uh, Sony breach which is a well known breach uh, 77 million uh, user data stolen as of uh, last year again through a web application uh, attack uh, you also had Nasdaq which we discussed previously again uh, through it was an application attack that happened so uh, clearly the attacks are happening on the business side and on the uh, internal side of things uh, because users already have access to these applications and uh, systems because you have the user IDs which are already there you don't really see attacks as in uh, SQL injections or cross site or buffer overflow or things like that but you see user credentials being used for misuse of uh, systems towards financial gains and what we have typically seen is user accounted account related or administrative account related information leading to what you see here as internal fraudulent transactions though it constitutes just 1.2 percent of the overall uh, uh, number of attacks but if you see the impact in terms of uh, the uh, financial losses that happen this possibly will contribute about uh, 70 to 80 percent of the financial losses so and it is the same trend that we also saw last year uh, when UBS fraud happened so which was like a two billion dollar fraud by one employee so the employee called Adaboli was essentially a person who had worked in the back-end systems uh, of UBS and he was then transferred to the uh, front office so he knew the internal control gaps that are there in the back office not only that he was able to use it's, uh, the simple concept of shared usernames and passwords in applications so though we have these policies and norms that says that you know don't share your passwords don't uh, it, typically people get to know passwords at the floor level so what he could do was to use his colleagues passwords to put up those uh, trading positions so that nobody could make out that he was executing the trading positions so it was a cumulative of many different accounts 
but he was uh, essentially creating those trading positions to benefit and finally what happened was it went out of control and UBS then lost about uh, 2 billion dollars based on this fraud. So it was a combination of uh, a knowledgeable employee uh, using a set of shared username passwords and then exploiting the internal control gaps which are there to actually execute the fraud. So that is the kind of internal, so it is all on the business side which basically means that in our approach we need to bring in uh, business context into the way we manage threats, the way we manage uh, vulnerabilities. So we need to actually have a more uh, business use case approach, we will see some example of that. We need to have more monitoring done at the uh, business application and the transaction layers because that is really where the attackers are targeting. So uh, at this point I just had a quick question, uh, how many uh, in the audience here actually monitor uh, the server logs? few hands, okay, that is fine, about 30, 40 percent maybe, yeah. And how many here monitor the business application logs? Okay, you still have 10 percent which is good. So the, uh, and how many here monitor transactions, either through InfoSec teams or some other teams monitoring the transactions? So you still have some, okay. So idea is to move up the layers in terms of monitoring more of servers, more of business applications, you know, more of databases and transactions and also looking at context of business with respect to assets and users etc. So how do you bring in uh, business context into uh, security testing for example? So typically today the way testing happens, uh, most organizations would use uh, any black box, you know whatever you call by a white hat and the result is usually seen as how many SQL injections do you have, how many cross-site scripting do you have on the internet banking application and then you start looking at how many are you fixing. But the biggest gap there is you are not really looking at the business use case. So there could be about two SQL injections in a certain page which transla translates to a particular attacker uh, uh, transferring huge amount of funds from a customer account into another account. So it could be just two SQL injections that are contributing to that business use case while the rest of uh, 15 SQL injections that you detected might not be of too much of business impact. But are you really mapping the business use case and then tracking your uh, uh, vulnerabilities and fixing it or it, you, you are just looking at it as statistics of how much of SQL injection was fixed etc. So the idea is you need to build uh, business use cases into testing in terms of, so when you uh, look at an application. The core concept is to be able to create a threat profile. So if I just take an example of say internet banking if somebody is testing, you would want to know what are the business use cases that can impact me. So if someone can uh, siphon off funds from an account, can someone view account statements of my other customers, uh, can you add beneficiaries into another account. Similarly the same thing could apply to telecom where if you are uh, looking at a CRM application can the or a billing application, can billing details be modified, can uh, somebody see your uh, customer data or in government it could be an e-government where uh, a business use case could be can an attacker come in and see uh, your citizen data and then take it out and do some fraud. So the idea is threat profile and context mapping is very critical and that is that should be the foundation for doing uh, security testing. Uh, similarly, business uh, context in monitoring comes through looking at business application monitoring. So uh, maybe if you have a telecom application which is a billing application or an application core banking application and banking, internet banking. So you look at the application uh, logs and then see uh, are there attempts at segregation of duties violations, are there uh, access violations. Uh, for example, an employee logging in at uh, you know before branch hours or before regular office hours into a critical application. Today those kind of monitoring may be happening at the OS level but only if you look at business application level you have more uh, information that can actually be used to exploit a fraud. So that is the kind of uh, uh, access logs we are looking at. Similarly you look at changes to critical application users, roles and groups. So are normal users able to add themselves as admin users and therefore do more things on the application. Uh, to change settings and change permissions etc. So a whole set of uh, uh, business logic can be built into monitoring using your business application. So that is becoming very critical as we go. 
and of course monitoring the uh, transaction layer because uh, once uh, what we have also seen is the business application exploit is then going on leading to a transaction fraud that is happening. So, uh, you could have employees logging in by exploiting the business application as say a normal user and then he uh, uses maybe a shared username password of an, uh, of an admin ID there to be able to give himself more permission and therefore execute a corresponding fraud. So, the transactions getting uh, monitored because after the business application logs uh, the next step is a transaction fraud So, and there are many transaction frauds happening. Uh, in banking it could be uh, internet banking, it could be you uh, are looking at ATM frauds, in telecom it could be e-commerce fraud because somebody is buying off a, a set of fake prepaid cards by uh, doing a fraud. So, idea is look at transaction logs and be able to know. Uh, be able to get a hang of what is happening at the business level. So, we will cover more of this in the uh, fraud, uh, the next uh, session which is on enterprise fraud. But the idea is uh, even with information security today you need to go up those layers in terms of monitoring to be able to bring in the business context into monitoring. So, that is the key uh, idea. The third concept I wanted to take was uh, threats today are very dynamic, but the mitigation cycles for an organization is practically very long. So, these are again uh, based on the, uh, the kind of security testing that we do in our SOC. We uh, kind of benchmark the vulnerabilities that we see and try to see which vulnerabilities actually uh, are the highest within the OWASP top 10. So, I am sure all of you know OWASP top 10 as the top 10 application security vulnerabilities which are there. And what we found is uh, the broken authentication and session management is possibly the highest, cross-site scripting comes the next highest and you have security misconfiguration. So, the, the question again uh, possibly with a quick show of hands, how many in the audience feel that if you detect for example, a cross-site or SQL injection or broken authentication and session management, uh, you could actually fix this vulnerability by changing application code, getting developers to work on it, testing it and releasing it in production. How many in the audience feel that you can actually do it say within a month? Okay, so how many feel you can do it within three months? Okay, how many within six months? Okay, there are some few hands. <laughs> okay, yeah, so the, the obvious gap which is there is uh, the vulnerabilities take a fairly long time to fix while the threats are evolving by the day, by the week, by the month, you know, so th that is the real challenge that we have. So, how do we bridge the gap? That is the question that we need to address. So, the first way of addressing the gap is to obviously have a better remediation and tracking system where you can actually look at all the different vulnerabilities that are there and uh, the ratings and be able to send it to remediation to be able to track it to closure better. So, you know what is the uh, aging of a certain vulnerability, you know how long is it there and what is the criticality of it. And the more important thing is uh, the biggest issue with fixing application vulnerability today is if you go to the developer and say that you know these are the bunch of SQL injections that you need to fix. Uh, obviously, the developer has a resistance because that is not what his core uh, issue is. He wants to develop more functionality. The second challenge to that problem is he also does not know how to fix it. So, there is a lot of resistance that because he does not know how to act on it, he obviously is going to delay fixing it. So, the idea is to be able to provide them with more assistance or empower the developer with a kind of solution repository that says if you have say for example, SQL injection, now here is a sample code, you know this is typically what you need to do to fix it, here is a mechanism of uh, fixing it. So, that he has more knowledge of how to fix it and he goes about fixing it. So, one example could be that you know if so for example, there is a cross site uh, uh, scripting CSRF attack you could actually have a repository that talks about, uh, I am not going to go into details of this, but the idea is you have a solution that talks about typically what is the concept behind the development that you need to do and what kind of sample code can you use. So, this will what in our experience what we have seen is this cuts down the time for fixing because the developer now has a much better feel of what you need to do to fix and hence he is able to do it quicker and over a period they get educated. Uh, so, apart from the awareness sessions that you have, you impart for developers, a repository enables them to do fixing quicker. So, you try to cut down on the time between the uh, vulnerability surfacing to the remediation uh, part of it. 
and of course uh, at any point in time uh, automating the remediation also cuts down time on the operation stream. So the activities that you could actually remediate for example if you see an attack happening and you need to change a rule on the firewall. So if you have a mechanism to automatically raise a high priority ticket for that so that somebody could see that it is already uh, occurred and then he needs to act on that it is usually faster because making a manual tracking and not uh, doing it in an automated fashion also creates lag within the operations uh, team. And the final part of uh, bridging that gap is uh, what you know or what you uh, see as data enables you to fix things better. So uh, there are certain metrics that you can track for example uh, what is the mean, MTTD is what is the mean time to detect, MTTR is what is the mean time to remediate. So you can actually kind of plot various levels of maturity in your organization which says that for example for any infrastructure vulnerability so maybe on servers, operating systems, web servers how much time does it take you to detect it and how much time does it take you to fix it. So mature organizations are obviously much uh, higher on the curve here because you have automated mechanisms to detect, fix etc. Whereas newer areas like an application, uh, uh, business application threat might be on a lower maturity side. But the core concept here is the moment you start tracking these metrics and you start looking at how it is proceeding for you over months, over year, you know which are the lag areas that you have and then you can find out reasons why uh, some things are taking more time for you, some things are taking lesser time. For areas that takes more time, how do you go about fixing it efficiently? So the whole idea is how do you track these metrics uh, better? So this will more or less address the bridge the gap between the time to uh, detect or the, the pace at which threats are happening to the pace at which you can actually go and fix these vulnerabilities or take action against the threats that are uh, happening. So the final uh, uh, area of threat that we wanted to take was, uh, so today assets are proliferating uh, you know uh, across the network and the threats can typically impact any asset not just high value assets. So uh, going by the examples of some of the threats that have happened over a period, uh, the TJX breach for example started with uh, compromise of one wireless access point in a remote retail branch and then it went on to uh, co compromise about 45 million uh, cards. So the whole idea is. Uh, from a very uh, static risk management uh, thinking that you have, that we all have, uh, you might think that you need to focus on only the high value assets. But the reality is you also have attacks which is going to come through the lower value assets and then creep into the uh, real uh, attacks. So today uh, InfoSec has become more like you know you need to have uh, multiple approaches. So you need to do a sprint on the high value assets and you will need to do a kind of marathon run on the low value assets. And to be able to do this fixing and managing both the high value and low value assets, what is fundamental is you need to have asset visibility which means do I really know what is running on my asset, do I know what weaknesses are there in my asset and do I know all my assets. So all of those are really the questions that, so asset visibility becomes an important point today. And how do you have an integrated asset uh, 360 degree view? We call it a 360 degree view because you can actually look at, uh, take an asset and see typical characteristics of an asset, uh, owner and IP address, etc. And you can also see the status in terms of uh, weaknesses, what is the status? In terms of threats, what is the status? Look at what are the open threats as of date, you know, how many are high, medium, low? Look at what are the open vulnerabilities as of date and also see the number of open items against the asset so that you can track it better. You can also see the number of uh, metrics like recurring threats, how many recurring threats are on there in the asset, how many recurring vulnerabilities. So just to expand on this, so you can actually look at recurring threats and then see that uh, possibly you know two types of threats like user privilege change has been happening uh, consistently. Uh, there has been outbound traffic from the server which is not supposed to be the case consistently. Maybe it is infected with a Trojan. So you get to have get more uh, meaningful information. 
you also need to look at what are the uh, recurring vulnerabilities. So same thing as threats, you look at uh, what are the recurring vulnerabilities, you know, uh, how many times is it uh, coming up again and if you actually do a deep dive and do a root cause etc., you might find out that it is essentially happening because you have uh, maybe a set of uh, uh, processes for fixing vulnerabilities is not secure enough, maybe your asset provisioning has weaknesses so that the baseline is not getting configured properly. So any change in the asset baseline does not get configured so you keep seeing these repeat vulnerabilities happening. So you can get to understand the issues and then do be able to fix it uh, consistently and also look at open tickets which means uh, what all the issues that are there against the asset and who is assigned the responsibility to fix it and what is the progress on that. And of course uh, today even the definition of asset is changing because you could have asset which is completely virtualized with so many things running on it, you could have uh, so many subsystems running in an asset. So the whole idea is to be able to manage the asset in an integrated fashion, you should know what are the components and subcomponents and look at what different services do you have running against the asset so that it gives you the complete picture on. Uh, so that kind of asset visibility is extremely critical today to one manage those higher impact attacks that will affect your assets as well as look at those lower value assets and see how well can you uh, manage it in the long term. So uh, summary of this session more or less is uh, you have a conventional way of managing security which is uh, today has pieces in terms of policies, you have uh, some level of monitoring, maybe you are monitoring your firewall logs, IDS logs, uh, maybe some level of server logs. You will have uh, testing done, you have, uh, you have all your firewalls and perimeter devices managed. But on top of this you need to add a layer of security intelligence, you need to add business context into the way you are managing security, you need to add uh, integrated visibility which is basically the asset visibility part of it and also you need to make your system faster which is essentially where you are bridging the gap between uh, the vulnerability detection or threat detection and the fixing. So uh, using those different techniques that we uh, discussed. So that is about what I had for uh, this session. So, so we will maybe if you have questions we can uh, take it up uh, now.